All right, so I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Winning in E-Commerce with Email Marketing. Running an e-commerce business really comes with its fair share of challenges. There are, of course, logistical challenges to figuring out when to step up and scale, to really finding the right people that you want to add to your team. And then with your already limited time and resources, you also have your marketing to worry about. When it comes to email marketing and e-commerce, winning really means getting the right messages and products in front of the right people at the right times. And to do that, that also means digging a little bit deeper into your data and going beyond those general promo blasts that you send to your entire contact list at the same time. And that means striking the right balance between sending too much and too little. So how do busy e-commerce sellers get it done and start adding more to their bottom line? Well, here at Constant Contact, we're on a mission to help you do just that by providing you with practical marketing advice, along with easy to use tools that help you to get real results for your business. Now, clearly e-commerce is booming at the moment because of the past few years. And whether you're just getting started or maybe you've been around for a while, we really wanna make sure that you're doing all that you can to get the most out of your business. My name is Stephanie French and I'm the content manager for webinars here at Constant Contact. And I'd like to thank you for choosing to spend a little time with us today. Like I said, our topic today is winning in e-commerce with email marketing. And today we're joined by the marketing director and director of customer relations for Capital T's, Elizabeth Davis. She's a constant contact customer and an e-commerce business that's been around since 2007. And today she's joining us to discuss a few things. She's gonna talk to us about how Capital T's has really grown their business over the last few years the marketing tools and strategies they're using to sell more and reach more people, and how AI technology really allows them to sell even more with email marketing. So Elizabeth, I wanna uh, welcome you if you wanna hop on the camera there. Hey Stephanie, how are you? Good, it's so great uh, for you to be able to share your experience and perspective with other e-commerce businesses. I know you and I preparing for this have, I've learned some good nuggets from you and I know you're gonna provide a lot of value to our audience. So thank you so much for being here and taking the time to do this with us today. Oh, well, thank you for having me and thank you to Constant Contact. I mean, I really appreciate it. Awesome, so I figured we could start out this conversation today by having you tell us a little bit more about your company, Capital T's. What's the business and how did it start? So Capital T started in 2007 with one store in Annapolis, Maryland, one store. Um, three years later, co-founder Peter Martino decided to stop practicing law to focus on growing his business. Um, in late 2010, he opened his second and third store in Bethesda, Maryland in National Harbor, Maryland. And then in 2011, he was able to open his first warehouse um, which is funny because before the warehouse was open, all the product was in his garage. So also later in 2011, he hired his first website coordinator. And I believe it was August of 2011, the company launched its first website. Um, over the next six years, Capital T's grew to, I believe, 24 stores in eight states, which built a rather large following of the brand. However, in 2017, Peter recognized that despite the fact that only 10% of his sales were coming from the website, 100% of his profits were coming from the website. So the company made the decision to close all the stores. And by August of 18, every single brick and mortar store was closed. That's where I come in. Um, Peter formed the company Anchor Beverages to take over the Capital T's brand in August of 2018. And they launched their website on September 21st, 2018 as a 100% e-commerce business. In September, the end of September, 2018, Peter approached me to come join his company as I am his oldest daughter. And I was at the time a student in marketing. So family tradition here is that in his 20s and 30s, my father, Peter, our CEO, worked for his father out of another very successful business venture. And I guess in keeping line with family tradition, I agreed to come work for him. I started as an intern and obviously three years later, I'm now the marketing director. So there's that. Um, Anchor Beverages 
is, as we said, an all e-commerce company. It owns the brand capital T's. Um, we, Peter wanted an expanded concept of Anchor Beverages, not just tea, but he wanted to incorporate a way to sell other healthy beverages. Um, thus, the mission of Anchor Beverages is to provide a customer with great, with great taste that makes you feel great. Um, in February of 2020, we were negotiating to open yet another very small brick and mortar store um, to kind of put a presence in Annapolis again. Um, and it was essentially a marketing opportunity. You know, our name is now on a store. More people are going to see us. Unfortunately, COVID hit in February of 2020, and we decided as a company that we weren't going to do it anymore, and we were going to continue marketing with our email marketing and our Facebook marketing and all that stuff. Awesome. So quite the story there, and I know we got a, a comment from Tia about what a great uh, family business story, so that's awesome. Now, uh, obviously, you know, that changed your business a lot, um, and I would assume helped you really to grow the business. What, if anything else that really changed that you can pinpoint once you started selling online? Um, so the website went from being a side thought. Uh, initially, you know, when they started their website, they were getting four to five orders a day, and those orders were shipping directly from the stores that were open. So it went from being a side thought to the whole thought. It was the entire company. There were no more stores. It was just online, and it seems to have worked, obviously. Awesome. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the e-commerce side of that, because obviously, you know, you're selling on your website. And I want to address a question that Laura asked when registering. She says, I'm an artist with Constant Contact. I need ideas on which e-commerce platform is best for the products I would like to sell. So can you talk a little bit about the e-commerce platform that you're using and how you actually came to choose that platform in the first place? So the platform we use is Big Commerce. Um, wonderful platform. I highly recommend it. Um, the way we chose BigCommerce, it was very simple. The platform we were using prior to BigCommerce did not provide us with what we needed. It, very basic. We need. We had certain needs. They weren't meeting our needs. So we did. We looked around at a couple different platforms, and we ended up deciding that BigCommerce was the right fit for us, and it is. It gives us what we need with the customer service we wanted. Awesome. And I know that's big. We'll talk a little bit more about Constant Contact later. But customer service and, you know, using different tools and products for your marketing is especially important. Um, now, of course, you mentioned 2020, and it was a really challenging year for everyone. And I don't want to harp on it too much, but I'd like to learn what kind of changes did you make in order to su survive 2020? So, yes, 2020 was, of course, a challenging year for everybody. Um, COVID-19 changed the way a lot of businesses run, especially even for us. Being an all e-commerce company, we still had a warehouse, we still had people as an office staff. Um, so initially we sent our office staff to work remote and we, we have a pick and pack team. We lowered our warehouse days from five to three. So now our warehouse was only open three days a week. Um, and we made sure we were following every health and safety rule that we could, temperature checks, making sure, you know, people had gloves on, hand washing, everything we had done before, we just made sure of it. And by limiting our warehouse hours, we limited contact with who could potentially spread COVID-19. Now, is there anything that you implemented during that time that you're using now or you're planning to keep around even after the pandemic is over? Yes, um, keeping the warehouse only open three days a week has actually worked for us. I know it seems a little crazy. It works very well for us. It's Monday, Tuesday, and Friday that our warehouse is open. We are going to continue in that path. Um, it also opens us up. We are actually currently looking for potential opportunities to help other e-commerce businesses ship their product, ship their e-commerce products. So, you know, we're in works with that. Um, the other thing is our staff is doing very well remotely. We are all remote, except for one day a week, those who do, who are in town, obviously I work from a different state. Um, they go into the office once a week, everybody's able to see each other, you know, talk about products, talk about upcoming things. And it's just something that's worked so well for us that we're gonna keep that going. That's awesome. I really loved your mention of, you know, helping other e-commerce businesses. That is, that is really cool. Now, what is one of the next things that you're gonna focus on either the business itself or maybe your marketing in order to grow the business? So we have a business plan, obviously, that we follow. 
and it's a five-step process. So I won't go into everything, but customer awareness, um, you know, engaging with our customers as per usual and building our brand, building our brand out, partnering with other people to help them with their e-commerce businesses, you know, expanding on what we already have. For example, we are getting ready to introduce a line of cat and dog teas. Previously, we've only marketed tea, you know, tea, tea wear, stuff like that. Um, an idea came across to us, actually to our CEO, and he emailed me and I thought he was joking. I actually laughed when I read the email and called him and said, this is a joke, right? Um, but no, it's not. We are in the works of our first blend of cat and dog tea. So we're really excited about that. Something else we um, just started is our tea cases. So you'll get 12 teas for a certain price. And it's once again, another brilliant idea from our CEO. Um, we're really excited about it. We're just really excited about building our brand and expanding. Awesome. Something we're all looking to do here in the audience today. Now, how do you or your CEO really decide what to focus on next for the business? So that's a collaborative effort. It's not just me. It's not just the CEO. Everybody who's involved in the company, whether it be our pick and pack team or warehouse manager or web manager, even my uncle, again, with the family business who runs our eBay store, we, you know, inspiration comes from many different ways. We collaborate. We talk. We, we see what's working. Um, we read, we read a lot. We do our market research. We look at, we are fortunate enough that we have other bigger entities that do what we do, um, that we can look and see what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them and kind of tailor it to how we want it to work and see if it'll work for us. Obviously it's a benefit. If it doesn't work for them, well, it probably won't work for us. So we have that viewpoint. It does really help. Gotcha. So I want to address something that you mentioned there is the eBay store. You have someone running an eBay store. Is that just like an additional sales channel for you? It is. It's just an additional sales channel for us. We have our, um, we have a lot of our tea wear on it. Um, it's just, you know, an additional sales channel for us. We also sell to Amazon as well. Awesome. Definitely something to think about for all of you in the audience, really to expand your reach, get in those other marketplaces and get your products and your business found. I think that's awesome. So I'd like to talk a little bit more uh, specifically about your marketing and selling online. When it comes to marketing, of course, that means using your website. You've mentioned that your online store, email marketing and social media, and they all need to be working together to help you achieve, achieve success. So let's talk about a little, a high level right now, and we'll get more specific a little later, but what are some of the strategies that have worked best for you to stay connected with your customers and generate sales? So first and foremost, email marketing. For us to stay in touch with our customers, it's our emails. Um, we send an email every day, and I know that's very daunting to some people. Some people are gonna say, wow, that's, that's a lot of emails, uh, but it works. In fact, it works so well that the one time in three years that I've been doing this that I didn't send an email, there was a death in our family, unfortunately, and I just didn't send an email that day. I received complaints from my customers the next day that they didn't get their email, which led me to believe that, you know, our emails are really reaching our customers. Um, we also have other channels, obviously our social media channel. We reach out to our customers that way, whether it's running contests to get them engaged with us, you know, someone sees, hey, if I do this, I'll get something free. Everybody loves to get something free. So that keeps our customers engaged. We keep in touch with them as well. We have an online chat that's available a couple hours a day um, during our, what we would consider our off season is available 10 to 12 hours a day during our busy season. That There is someone there constantly talking with customers if they need a recommendation, if they need help brewing something, if they need help, you know, oh, I don't know which tea would work right for me. There, we're there, we're constantly there. We have an 800 number you can call if you're having trouble with our website or if you just don't know what you're looking for. Um, so we have a multitude of ways, but I will say our email marketing is our biggest. We also, before COVID, we would go to trade shows and we are actually very excited that we are heading back in the next couple of weeks to the Annapolis Boat Show. We will have a stand there. We'll be giving out some free samples. We'll be selling our tea subscription. So we're very excited to get back out there, but multiple different ways. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit more about social media because I know this is a conversation on a lot of people's minds today. And we find that here in the audience at Constant Contact, a lot of people often feel lost. So tell us a little bit more about your approach to social. 
Um, I know you mentioned contests, but is there anything else that you've seen work particularly well? So making sure that our, we have a rotating schedule of deals. That's just how we do it. Our sales rotate on a constant basis. Making sure our sales are on our social media pages is the first and foremost thing. Um, make sure they're there. It works in tandem with your email marketing. I'm going to say social media alone, it, while it's a great tool, you have to have it work in tandem with your email marketing. Um, contests, like I said, contests are a big one. A lot of people, you know, uh, in the past, we've used one, hey, post a picture of your favorite tea and enter a chance to win, you know, a $10 gift card. And a lot of people responded to that. We got a lot of great pictures. Uh, we did use some of those pictures on our, our other social media platforms. It was great. Um, making sure when people comment, on your pictures or comment on your posts or even in you know all these social media platforms have messaging services make sure you're responding to them that way too it's a big deal people want to be heard and social media is a great way for people to feel like they're interacting with you from a one-on-one -on -one standpoint more than a broad email broadcast again though it ties in with your email marketing our social media channels are all listed on our email marketing as well and when we for example when we do run a contest on social media. We will make sure that our email says, hey, check out our social media sites for your contest. So it sends people over there. So it works. So just to follow up on that with your contest, are, um, are you collecting their email address for the contest and then adding them to your email list? Is that how it works for you or? Not necessarily. Um, obviously, we're not going to collect an email without permission. We don't buy lists. We don't, all of our emails are organically collected through us. They are given to us. Um, I have had people that have come on and said, you know, privately messaged one of our reps saying, hey, here's my email. Can you add it to your list? And we will absolutely do that for you. Okay. So it's not always, however, yes, um, most of our communication for, I will say for winners, we do email them, but we don't add them to the list unless they ask. Good point. I know there was a couple people who registered for that and they were asking where to get lists and things like that. So I'm glad you brought that up. We don't ever recommend buying a list or renting a list or anything like that. You're going to get the most value out of your email marketing when people actually willingly, willingly give you their email address. Otherwise, it's not going to be worth your time. So I don't know if there's anything else you might want to add to that, Elizabeth, but very important. I completely agree. All of our emails, all of our contacts, and we have quite a few, are organic from us. We we never buy lists, we never rent lists, we don't want it that way because obviously we don't want to sell to people who don't want to hear from us. That's just how it is. You never, ever, ever want to buy a list. You're just, it's not a good idea. Awesome. Well, thank you for helping us address that. Now, in our conversations with e-commerce sellers in the past, uh, we've heard many times, you know, how important, and of course this is to you as well, about how important having an email list is. That is what allows you to reach your customers directly, drive those sales. And this is something we've been preaching here at Constant Contact for a really long time. But the truth is you have to start somewhere. So I believe you have quite a large amount of contacts at the moment, but what are some of your strategies and best advice for helping our audience to get more email subscribers? So pre-pandemic, um, one of the ways, just one of the ways we did, again, was being out, being you know omnipresent. Obviously, we're an e-commerce company, but we were out at those trade shows, get, say, showing our name. Our loyal customers would come. They would bring their friends. Their friends would sign up. The other way we do it is, again, Facebook. Instagram, Twitter, uh, Snap, not Snapchat. Yes, yeah, Snapchat. We have used Snapchat. I apologize. Um, you know, we run our ads on there. We say, hey, sign up for our newsletter. On our chat, our live chat, when talking to a customer who may be new, hey, do you, do you get our newsletter? If, oh, do you want to try, sign up for it so you can know when our deals are coming? You'd be amazed at how many people say yes. Um, it's, it's very simple. Just make sure you're out there. Make sure your brand is out there. Get people who know who you are and they'll get interested. Definitely. I think that's a really important point is, you know, just making sure you're simply asking people. And you made a point there, you know, letting people know the value they're going to get in return. You know, if they're signing up for daily deals and information, you know, if that's valuable to them, they're more likely to give you their information. Um, I will also add that um, we have, you know, as any good company does, you know, have an incentive. If you want people to sign up for your email, give them some incentive to do so. So for us personally, you sign up for our, email, our constant contact emails, you get a welcome email and 10% off your first order. That doesn't hurt. And let me tell you, it does bring them back. 
I completely agree. Yeah, having that incentive there, it's a perfect example of, of what can work for so many of you. Now let's talk a little bit more about your email marketing strategy. You've mentioned uh, a few things about it already, but what's really working for you and what is your strategy when it comes to email marketing? So what's working for us, and I'm going to preface this with, it's not going to work for everybody, okay? So no one be daunted or think this is what you have to do. What works for us is a daily newsletter, a daily email. We send seven newsletters a week. That means one newsletter every day. As I said before, the one time I didn't send it, I had people complaining. Um, and the way we got to that is we tried multiple things. We kept what worked, as our CEO would say, we kept what worked, we got rid of what didn't. And what happened to work for us was a daily newsletter. So that's how we figured it literally by what our customers wanted. Awesome. So I know we talk to small businesses all the time. They're initially, they're afraid to send emails really a lot. They feel like they're spamming people. They feel like they don't want to send too much. So can you talk a little bit more about how you came to that decision for every day? Were you looking at your reports or just feedback from your customers? So one of the biggest things is you look at your analytics, look at your data for your emails, your open rates, your unsubscribe rates, all of those things. And it can't just be a week's worth. You gotta look at a couple months. Um, looking at a couple weeks worth doesn't hurt you, but you want a good you know, month or two or three to kind of see. And it will guide you in the right direction, okay? So this person, I mean, and for us, we have constant contact. So obviously we, we have that data right as we log into our platform we can see that data um you know you just again it comes down to see what works for your customers one thing we've done in the past is we've used polls um for, from different companies like hey reach out to our customers what would you like to see it again it's always about what the customer wants and what works for us you have to have those two working together otherwise it's not going to work so, so important about what they want. Don't just think about what you want and to get more sales, um, but really think about, you know, the content and what you're sending, which I'd like to ask you too, can you elaborate on what it is you're sending every day? Oh, I'd love to. So this is my bread and butter. Um, I love this because I am the one that sends a newsletter every day. It's something I really do enjoy doing. Um, our newsletter, first and foremost, starts with a catchy subject line. Okay, that's first advice. Catchy subject line, not too long, not too short. Make sure it's very informative too. Um, the second thing you'll see when you open our newsletter is a graphic of some sort. Um, whether it be, let's say right now, we are doing the 175th anniversary of the finding Neptune, the planet Neptune. Um, so we're running a sale on that today, that believe is. it or not. It's great. It's 25% off all our tea. Um, and the graphic, I, I wish I could share a picture of this really cool. You can see the planet Neptune. It's very cool. So we incorporated that into our graphic. Along with that, we have some of our favorite teas, some of the teas we like. You know, I have eight teas I list every day with links to those actual web pages, those landing pages. Um, like I said, I alternate them every day because not everybody likes the same thing. So I make sure I put something in there for everyone. Um, below that, you've got a tea joke of the day. Uh, one of my personal favorite things, a little bit corny sometimes, but I love it. So there's that. We have a tea recipe, whether it be a cocktail, a shake, a smoothie, a hot toddy. Um, I think we very recently did like a latte recipe with our tea. We have that for customers who may be looking for something a little bit different with their tea. We also have a news article every day. We've got a news article in there for you of why tea is good for you. Uh, you know, health benefits of green tea or how tea lowers cholesterol, something along those lines, all scientifically backed. Uh, we also have, obviously we run our current promotions too. We have our clearance items are always in there. We always have our social media links in there. It's really important to have good quality content and something that's interesting. You don't just wanna send an email, here's our sale, that's it. You, you want some interesting content in there too. Yes, that is the value and that's the things that people are signing up for. And I love your point about just adding a little bit of fun. I love your idea for the tea joke of the day. So I recently signed up and I need to go check my email today. I think it was yesterday or the day before. So I need to get some ideas for your, your tea jokes. That's awesome. By all means, in fact, I'm not going to take full credit for the tea joke. Before it was a tea joke, it was a tea fact of the day. 
Um, and I'm going to give the credit to our CEO there. Uh, Peter is, Peter's very good at things like this. I, you know, I'm the marketing manager It is what it is, but I lean on our CEO when I need some content. If I'm coming, drawing a blank, it, it's a great way to show, you know, small company, we really do work together. It really is a collaborative effort, but yeah, Peter came up with a tea joke of the day. And once again, as how that came up is one day I sent him something that I thought was funny. It was a tea pun. And all of a sudden we had a tea joke of the day. So, you know, there's that. That's how a lot of good things really come up. Now you mentioned subject lines and I know, I, I'm wondering if you'd be interested in sharing maybe some of your most effective subject lines. That's a huge question we get from people all the time. They just wanna figure out how to write those great subject lines. So the beauty with constant contact is if you're struggling, there's two things you can do. And I will give you some ideas, but I wanted to point this out. There are two things you can do because everybody has writer's block as what I call it, writer's block. We always do. You're going to have some sort of block. You're human. It's normal. Um, with us, since we have constant contact, we have the ability that there is a subject line maker that I can type in what I'm trying to say, and it will generate some things for me to try. We also have subject line A and subject line B, which we are getting ready to incorporate. We just started, or we're just starting to use that now, is where we'll write two separate subject lines, and whichever subject line works, that's the email that will be sent. Um, subject line that has worked for us it's believe it or not a pun we had a sale on oolong teas and the pun was you've waited a long time for this and people i it got a lot of attention it was funny it was eye-catching um some of the other ones we've used obviously holiday time make sure you're mentioning as holidays you know really recently happy labor day um on September 21st, it was International Day of Peace. Our subject line was stay peaceful with a cup of tea. You know, we make sure we're incorporating what's going on in the world, what may be going on for that specific holiday, but reminding people like, hey, we're tea, you want to drink us. I love it. So many great ideas there. And hopefully, um, um, Elizabeth, you're inspiring everybody else. So thank you for that. Now, obviously, email is a big driver for sales for sales for you at Capital T's and also many other businesses out there. So in just a moment, I want to hear from you, Elizabeth, on the impact of email on your sales. But I'd really take a, a minute to run a poll with our audience. And I'd just love to know how much impact do your email marketing efforts have on your sales? So let's go ahead and get that poll up. There we go. So the question is, how much impact do your email marketing efforts have on your business sales? So you might say, I don't know, less than 10%, between 11 and 25%, between 26 and 35%, or 36% or more. So right now, we've got the majority of people saying, I don't know. 29% right now are saying less than 10%, and a few are saying, about 13% is showing 36% or more. So we'll give everyone just a, another minute or two to share their answers with us. Now it looks like the answers are starting to even out a little bit more as more people get in there and start voting, so. And the thing I want to point out for those of you who are saying, I don't know, I would definitely recommend to figure out a way that you can track that information because that's how you'll know what, what you might need to change in your email marketing strategy. And Elizabeth, you know, in our tool, you're, you're able to easily see this right in your constant contact account. So while everyone is uh, adding in their final votes, I see 59% of you have voted so far. Maybe you could share with us what percentage of your sales do you attribute to your email marketing? So we attribute about 50% of our sales to email marketing, which is a big number. Um, obviously, email marketing, it's, it's extraordinarily important. I, I can't preface this enough. It is extraordinarily important, especially in an e-commerce business. So yeah, we attribute about 50% of our sales to email marketing. That is awesome. So let's go ahead and close that poll, Rachel. You're helping me behind the scenes and we'll share the final answers there. 
So 31% of you said, I don't know. 25% of you said less than 10%. 21 were between 11 and 25%, 14% between 26 and 35. And 36 per, or 10% of you uh, are attributing 36% or more of your email marketing. And I looked up a stat the other day, I forget what the, the uh, source was, but it was, you know, about uh, 30 to 35 percent I want to say so I would say Elizabeth you're definitely doing really good with your email marketing and I know the tool you're using we'll talk about I think is helping you out there as well yeah so very awesome all right so I believe before constant contact you were actually using another uh, provider before would you mind actually sharing what made you look for a different email marketing provider so the provider we were using it's a really simple answer. Um, we needed certain things. We wanted certain things. They didn't provide those things. So we went and we looked elsewhere. Uh, whether it was, you know, we needed more functionality for our emails. We wanted to be able to send certain emails that our provider wasn't allowing us to do. So we decided to make a change. Awesome. What ended up attracting you to Constant Contact? First and foremost, and I know he's here. So the first thing that attracted me, obviously we met with a couple different email providers, um, but what stood out to me with Constant Contact was the ease of customer service. Um, my personal customer service specialist, Mr. Nate, he is here today, um, just to kind of give you an idea of how personalized your experience will be. Nate knew I was a little bit nervous about this and took the time today to be here to watch me speak. So if that gives you an idea, I mean, the, the service you don't get for most people. So customer service was a big deal. If I had a question, it was answered. I never felt like I was ignored. I never felt like I was, if I didn't understand something, it was explained to me. They gave me slides, everything I needed. And they said, don't hesitate to ask questions. Don't hesitate to reach out. It was a big deal for me, especially coming off of a company where it wasn't as catered towards the customer as I would have liked it to be. The second was the AI. Um, I had heard about AI in email marketing. I had never seen it used before. So knowing Constant Contact had it, that really drew me in, especially because AI is such a wonderful tool when you're email marketing. It really does help you out. That's awesome. And I would say a big, really any, most of our customers, you know, love our support team. So really big shout out to them today. So the tool you're using, yeah. Yeah, so the do. tool you're using with AI and automation, it uses a bit of a different pr approach. So you're still able to do these traditional things like you are doing, Elizabeth, like sending an email to everyone, creating some segments of customers, but you're also adding a new layer of sales thanks to the artificial intelligence. And it takes all of the data and information you're getting about your customers behind the scenes, it analyzes it, and then it predicts what messages individual contacts should receive and also when they should receive them. Now, of course, that automates the process of sending those emails so you can send those emails with the right message at the right time. And so where most people are out there, they're creating lists or segments to send messages to. With the AI and automation, you're using what's called stages, Elizabeth. Um, and I know we were talking about this earlier. You but were. For, for example, someone who's new to your brand, they can receive messages that allow them to start building a relationship with you. Whereas someone who's in the ready to buy stage, you know, can receive messages that are more focused on converting the sale. And so that means you're you're really improving your email results, more engagements, better responses. And of course, that means you don't have to worry so much about all of the emails you're sending and the timing and the frequency and all of that, because the AI predicts and automates so much of it for you. So if you could talk a little bit more about the stages you're using and if there were maybe any hesitations when you first started using the tool. So for me, no, there were no hesitations for the stages strictly because it, it's a wonderful tool. It really does engage your customers. As you were saying, we do, we have multiple stages active right now. We have our welcome email. We have our ready to buy email. We have our a cart abandoned email. We have our search abandoned email. We also have a stage right now where it says, I think it's ready to buy two is how we labeled it. Meaning these people have purchased with us before. It may have been a month or so ago. Maybe they're ready to refill. So that email automatically goes out to them. It's amazing. Um, it really takes the guesswork out of having to like, oh, is this person ready? Or, oh, 
you didn't, you, you abandoned your cart. Should I call or should I, you know, reach out via email and see, you know, what was going on? The AI takes that away from me. I don't have to worry about that because the stages with the AI are doing it for me and it's fantastic. So was there, that's really awesome. Is there anything else you maybe you want to add about the automation and um, what it's like to, I would assume, save yourself a ton of time in your, in your job? So obviously I don't just sit here and send emails all day. Um, one of the beautiful things about it is knowing that my emails are going to go out, knowing that I don't have to worry about a time. So with our former provider, it was always a question of what time do I send this email? Because when I sent that email, that's when it went. The email was in the inbox and let's say Cindy Lou Who doesn't check her email till two o'clock. Okay, well then Cindy Lou Who's probably not gonna see my email. However, with this AI in place, the AI has realized that Cindy Lou Who doesn't check her email till two o'clock. So that email that I sent at 10 o'clock that morning doesn't get delivered to Cindy Lou Who's email inbox till 1.59, guaranteeing that I'm on the top of the page. And so, hey, there's a deal I like, hey, my tea's on sale and they feel, you know, they see our emails. And it's a wonderful thing to know. Also, like I said, I don't send emails all day. I have other things I have to do. Uh, so being able to know those stages are there, that I don't have to worry about that, knowing that I can go ahead and send this email at 10 o'clock my time, which is 11 o'clock East Coast time, and knowing it's gonna get into that inbox when that person opens their email, takes a whole level of pressure off of me. And it allows me to go about my day and do everything else I need to do without really worrying about the email. You just explained that feature so beautifully and what it's like to use AI or artificial intelligence. So great job there. Thank now, you. we're going to get to the questions, the Q&A here in just a couple of minutes. But what would be maybe one thing that you'd recommend to all of our e-commerce sellers here today who are looking to grow their business? So everybody, obviously, in e-commerce business, it's a struggle. It can be, especially to start up. You, you need to get contacts. You know, first and foremost, don't stress. If you're constantly worried, it just doesn't help you. Um, but my biggest advice is, again, our CEO, who is, and this is where it comes from, he is, he served in the Navy for nine years. He's graduated of the United States Naval Academy. And he always, always, always refers back to those who will not risk cannot win, said by John Paul Jones. So my biggest advice to you is take the risk. Um, to start up, even an e-commerce business, to start up, it, it's such a low cost for an email marketing. Um, what, do you, what do you have to lose? It's a low cost. You don't know if it's going to work. Take the risk. You should always take the risk. It's worth it in the end. I can't agree with you more. As with anything in business, you know, taking that risk, trying things, figuring out what works for your business, what works for your audience. So great. Now, I want to mention that we've got a variety of marketing tools and features to help small businesses and nonprofits. And of course, if you're in e-commerce as well, the tools that Elizabeth is using as well. We're going to have Rachel, who's helping behind the scenes, uh, share a link if you want to check out the plans that are available. Um, and you can go in there and do that and see what's going to work well for you. So let's get into some of these really great questions that have come in here, uh, Elizabeth. So Aaron asks, how much should you spend for your initial e-commerce site build? And then I'll, I'll ask you a second part of that question uh, a little bit later once you're done. Okay, so don't, I don't want anybody to see this as a daunting number, but it is. Initially, you're going to spend at minimum $10,000, minimum, for a good e-commerce website. You can build a traditional website for much less, but if you want an e-commerce business like ours, you need to go with an e-commerce website. So you're looking at about $10,000 at minimum to start. And uh, was yours uh, custom created for you or was that something you did in-house? So our e-commerce has, they have templates. Our web designer then custom created our templates. We had templates we could base off of and then our web designer created what our website looks like today. Awesome. Can you describe the cost for an ongoing site as well? So an ongoing site, roughly, you're going to spend about 1000 to maybe $1,100 a month. Now, again, I know that seems like a lot of money, and it is. However, if you think about it this way, a traditional brick and mortar store, okay, you have rent, you have utilities, you have your staff you have to pay because the staff has to be there. Okay, we're an e-commerce business, we're open 24-7. That doesn't necessarily mean we're constantly here, 
but we're open all the time, but you have a staff, okay? You've got all these other things that add up, which is two or three times more than what you would spend monthly on an e-commerce business. So I know a thousand, eleven hundred seems like a lot, but if you look at it from another perspective, it's not, it's in the grand scheme of things, it's really not. Awesome. What were, this question comes from Kristen, what were your critical decisions the first time you decided to use Constant Contact? So critical decisions. Well, like I said with our prior email, we also saw another problem we have with our prior email is that we saw towards the end of us using them that our bounce rate was really, really high and our unsubscribe rates started getting really high and then our emails were winding up in spam. A really good portion of our emails were winding up in spam. We had no idea why. And at that point we said, okay, this isn't working. We, we need to go somewhere else and we need to go quickly. So obviously, you know, that was a very critical factor for us. We needed our emails to be reaching our customers and they weren't, so we needed to go. That is something all of us behind the scenes work really hard to make sure we're keeping that deliverability rate up. So great point there. Ricardo now asks, what's worked best for you regarding email blasts and people actually reading or opening your email? So this comes back to what I said about subject lines. The first thing you see when you open your inbox is that subject line. Now, if I wrote 20% off tea, that's not really engaging. Um, I, it gets the point across, sure, but it's not engaging and it's not enticing. And those are two things you want, especially in any marketing campaign. You need to be enticing, you need to be engaging. You want those customers to see it and go, oh, what's that? And click on it. You want that initial reaction. So the first thing I would say to focus on is your subject line. Make sure it's not overly long because you don't want people reading and getting bored. Make sure it's catchy, something, you know, use a pun use like we do use holidays use something that you know that you can incorporate into your brand and make sure it's informative a lot of subject lines i see are not informative enough you need to make sure you're informing your customers hey this is what's going on so those are three things also the biggest thing for me the first thing you see when you open any email is that graphic that first graphic like what your sale is and that's any company i've ever seen Make sure that graphic is eye-catching. Make sure it's enticing. Again, with the enticement, you don't want people to get bored. So um, automation in your graphics. Use those animated, you know, I've, I've used, um, in a Christmas one, Santa was dancing around. Um, we've used stars falling, stuff like that. It really does catch the customer's eye, and they're interested, and they want to see more. Always make sure you're catching the customer's eyes. Really important. So many great points there with your subject line and and graphically as well. Now Tracy asks, how to come up? How do you come up with content that their customer that your customers want to know about? So con content can come from anywhere. Um, as I said before, Peter came up with a tea joke of the day. Just something we knew we needed some humor, something light. Obviously, we're trying to sell, but we we want people to be interested. Again, like our news article, we also we research. We look, again, we look at what other companies do, what's working and not working. We look at our data. We look at our analytics. We see, okay, we can go into our heat map, which is really cool. We can go into our emails and look at our heat map. Okay, what did the customers like? What did they click on? What didn't they like? What didn't they click on? And we can edit from there. So if you're starting up, you have to, again, another thing, a poll. Find out what they want and then incorporate that into your email. The biggest thing is making sure you're doing what people like. Now, you're not going to please everyone all the time. It's not your job, but to have a great email, make sure your content is good to have good content. Make sure you're doing your research. Always, always, always be research. I never stop researching. I love that point about research and looking at what your customers are already engaging with in your emails. That's so important. And oftentimes they see people, maybe they're not sure where to start or how to figure out that information. Your click reports um, and really any report with your marketing is so valuable. It really is. So Anne Patrice asks, what would you say are the three main components in terms of product, your product marketing and product and marketing strategy that draws people to your product? First one, education. Educate yourself on what you're selling, then educate your customer on what you're selling. Educate yourself, educate customer. Always how it goes. Make sure you know so you can get deliver their education to them correctly. The second one I would say would be experiential what that means is so our customers let's say we have a customer that goes in and buys these two teats religiously well 
we pack those and we ship those out. But in every single order we ship out, we put in two to three samples. Now those samples are things that they may not have tried or they may not have even thought of trying. So, and everybody, and this has come from customers that I've personally spoken to, they use the samples because free samples, right? Um, they use them and they're like, oh, this is great. So then they order that too on top of their order. And in the next order, they get more samples and it just, it works very well for us. The third I would say is consistency. Consistency in your product. Make sure your product, like our product, 100% top of the line product. We make sure we only buy, sell, and blend top of the line product. We absolutely make sure of that because that's what our customers want. Make sure the way you package is consistent. Make sure the way you market is consistent. Our emails every day, like I said, consistency is key. Make sure you are constantly giving that customer what they want, even if they don't know they want it. I love it. So many great points there, especially the consistency when it comes to email marketing, especially if you're not, you find that every day is not going to work for you for your email marketing. Maybe you want to, you know, start out sending once a month, but if you do it on a consistent basis, people are going to start to expect that. And if you miss it, like Elizabeth has in the past once, you know, people are probably going to let you know, say, hey, where's my email? Oh yeah. They don't worry. And another point, if you're worried about if the customers like it or don't like it, they're going to tell you. I promise you, bar none, if they don't like something or they really like something, they tell you. As long as you're reaching out to them, as long as you're keeping those lines of communication open, those customers are more than willing to come to you and be like, I didn't like this. Or, oh, hey, I really like this. It never fails. Great point there. So um, let's see if we can get through a couple more questions here. I see one from Anne, and I'm not sure if you have enough experience in this, so let me know if this isn't your, your, in your real house. But Anne asks, do they integrate so, uh, Google Analytics tracking with their emails to see what, email, what emails produce the purchase? I'm not sure if we integrate Google Analytics into our emails. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I believe Capital T's did in the past. I'm just not sure we do right now. That would be more of a question for my CEO, and obviously he's not here right now, so. Gotcha, well, great. Um, but definitely Google Analytics can be something that you can implement in there and further the, the tracking information. So Drew asks, since emails are sent out daily, is there content that is created in advance? Can you tell us a little bit about your process? Yes, we do have content that's created in advance, especially, this is a great question, Drew, um, especially for sales, kind of like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, obviously we're an e-commerce company, which means those days are extraordinarily busy for us. We've got customers we're dealing with internally, we've got our own things going on, we're trying to make sure everything's running smoothly. So yes, we do create content in advance. In fact, a lot of times we create content in advance, so we're ready to go. You never want to be caught off guard. Um, for example, Cyber Monday. Big day for us, obviously big day for a lot of e-commerce companies, but we have one big deal that we run all day. On top of during the day, we have deals that change every four hours. Now, mm -hmm. obviously I'm not expecting people to sit there and create content every four hours. No one would get any sleep, no one would get any work done. So yes, we constantly have things that we're doing beforehand. We're prepping, we're making sure it's all ready to go. It also gives us a chance to, as a team, look over it, make sure it's exactly what we want, what our customers would like. And if it's not, we can critique it, create different things, you know, kind of make it to where our customers would like. So yes, we absolutely. So it sounds like you're creating it quite a quite a ways in advance. Like how far in advance do you work? Um, it really just depends. Uh, sometimes a week, sometimes a month. It really just depends on what we have that week, um, how many sales we have coming up. Um, it it just it constantly changes. That's a good thing to know. All right. So Elena asks, with sending daily newsletters, um, actually that act. That was my follow-up question. We just answered that, so never mind on that one. So Latrice asks, do you use text messages as well? And I know we were talking a little bit about this before we went live. We do actually, um, and I'm so sorry to bring that up. We do use, in conjunction with email marketing, social media marketing, and obviously our, our presence at trade shows and the boat show, we do. We just started using text message marketing not that long ago. Um, it's very successful. We, we do like it. It is a little trickier, especially if you're new to the text message marketing game, because you have a limit of how many characters you can have. You have a limit of how big your image can be. 
And it's a phone. You don't want to overload people with information. No one wants to see that 12 paragraph text message pop up on their phone. It's very unlikely someone will read it and that is personal experience. Um, but we do use it and we've been very successful with it. My tips on that are keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it informative, keep it eye-catching, just as you would for email marketing. I was just going to reiterate that. So awesome. So the next question is, what are the effective call to action items that you include in your emails? So the most effective for me, um, I'm thinking of our data. Probably, I wish I could show you a layout. With our emails, we have multiple call to action items. We do. There's probably 14 or 15 in each email. The most effective, I have to have been just one, then right under our main graphic, there's a shop now button big call to action, correct? That is the number one hit button when you go, again, looking at our heat map from our AI. That's a really big button that's hit quite a bit. They see that graphic, they want to shop immediately. Um, having our T's, the eight T's that are listed, and if I could, it's one, two, three, four, the way they're laid out. Those being there, those are big call to actions too, because they see the sale, they go, mm, but am I interested in any of this? They're able to scroll down and they're right there in front of them. And those are big hits too. Um, I think people really do like having an idea of what products are available for sale that day. And I have noticed that we get a lot of activity on those. That's awesome. So Bridget asks, would constant contact work for a medical medical billing company or is it more outfitted for e-commerce? Personally, I don't know much about medical billing companies. I wish I did. And I admire you for a medical billing company. That's that's um, quite the undertaking. Um, I think it would work, uh, especially, you know, it, it, if you're sending out, I don't know what you would send out with a medical billing, uh, I'm guessing bills. Um, I think it would work if someone has something overdue. Yeah, I believe constant contact could work for you. I mean, that's something you could talk with your customer success strategist and when you're onboarding with them, let them know what you're trying to do and they'll let you know how they can help you. I, I do believe they could work for you though, yes. Awesome. And we have lots of tools at Constant Contact and advice to help you all along the way. So uh, feel free to, to reach out to our team if, if you've got any more follow-up questions and they can have that kind of consultation one-on-one -on -one with you to make sure that'll work for your business. So the next question is, what do ongoing, ongoing website expenses include? So that, again, with the uh, question that was asked earlier, ongoing website expenses. So you've got your e-commerce platform, you've got your email marketing platform, you've got your SMS platform, but then you've got some ads, like subscription-based services. Our subscription-based service is a third-party app. So there's a cost for that too. There's a cost for uh, the person who's running the website, our, you know, our web manager. Um, there's cost for everything, just like in a brick and mortar store. But at the end of the day, it's totally worth it. I would say your main costs are gonna be there, your e-commerce platform, your email marketing. There is really no cost for social media marketing. We've, we've seen that. Um, however, if you are selling on a social media platform, you may incur a cost if you have a marketplace with them. So that's always something to remember and think about that there is always cost. Um, you're going to have a cost for your credit card processing company. You're going to have a multitude of costs. There's a bunch of different things. It kind of just depends on what you're selling and who you're working with. It's a really great breakdown of a lot of good things to think about as you're getting it all set up. So Richard asks, what is your average unsubscribe rate? Is that something you're willing to share? Oh, absolutely. Right now, our average unsubscribe rate is 0.05%. Pretty good. We are very excited about that. I was wondering if that question would come across and I was fully prepared to answer it. We're very awesome. excited. We have an extraordinarily low unsubscribe rate. Awesome. So I see a few people asking in the, the questions window uh, your your website address, and it's capitaltees.com. Is that correct? www.capitaltees.com. And I know a lot of you out here right now, you may be starting an e-commerce site. You may be in the midst of building one. You may have had an e-commerce site for a year. My advice to you, drink some tea hit our website up, drink some tea. It really does help you focus. I promise there are studies that back that and take a breath. It's, it's easy to do, but yes, our website is www.capitaltees.com. 
I know I definitely need to order some more tea. So thanks for that reminder. So let's try to get to one or two more questions here. Jeff asks, when you review the analytics from a campaign, do you target the opens and clicks for a specific follow-up? Sometimes. That's kind of the beauty of having the AI in place. Um, we don't necessarily have to. Our AI, the AI is doing that for us as well. So I can I go in and review it? Absolutely. Are there certain people I've followed up with myself? Yes. But is the AI doing that for me? Yes. And that is the beauty of the AI. It, should I, am I monitoring it? Absolutely. But I really don't have to do much because the AI is reading that and sending out whatever they may need, whether it be, okay, they, they, they bought this and it's been two months. So they're following, the AI is following up with me already with that email. It's wonderful. I, I can't stress enough. The AI really does so much of the work for you and probably saves you so much time in your day. So you can focus on all the other tasks that I know you're you're busy doing. I think I told I think it was Nate. I was talking to Nate at one point that I feel like having the AI was like cloning me. It's like having another me that literally just does all the email, and it's it's just a wonderful tool. You're not the only person I've heard say that. It's like having a whole another employee there for you that uh, you know doesn't have that overhead of the their salary. So exactly free employee who can turn that down. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it looks like we've got uh, gone through all of the questions. And Elizabeth, I want to thank you so much. You've shared so many great little nuggets of information with us today. And thank you to all of you who were watching and participating and sending us your questions. As you leave the webinar today, I'd really love it if you just take a minute or two to provide us with some feedback. Two simple questions. It shouldn't take more than a minute or two. Uh, let us know what you thought about the webinar today. And again, thank you so much, Elizabeth. We're gonna go ahead and close out of the webinar and I hope you uh, continued success in your business. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks so much, Stephanie, and good luck to everybody in the audience. Bye now. Bye.